1899, a temperamental Canadian scientist had a vision of sending music and speech over the wireless. It took him seven years, but in November of 1906, he sent a wireless signal over 10 miles where the sound was perfect. Ready for how radio began? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. Let me tell you a bit about Reginald Fezzen. He was born in Canada, but when he was 20 in 1886, he moved to the United States to try to get a job with Edison. Fezzedin went to Edison with an introduction and Edison responded with a slip of paper that said, quote, I'm very busy. What do you know about electricity? Fezzedin honestly replied, do not know anything about electricity, but can learn pretty quick. Whereupon Edison spat, I have enough men now who do not know about electricity. However, Fezzedin persevered and eventually got a job bearing electrical lines for Edison. Fezzedin quickly moved up the ranks to become Edison's chief chemist. Fezzi, as Edison called him, heard about Hertz's experiments in creating and transferring radio waves. He asked Edison permission to study wireless, which Edison agreed to do as soon as he returned from the Paris Exposition. However, as soon as Edison returned, the whole laboratory was shut down due to financial difficulties and Fezzedin was out of a job. He then worked for a while for Edison's rival, George Westinghouse, who helped Fezzedin get a job as a professor. It was as a professor in 1898 that he was asked to do some wireless experiments. Fezzedin declined, told them to ask Marconi, but it got him thinking about wireless again. He realized that plenty of people were conducting wireless experiments, but no one was doing any scientific studies with exact measurements. The big handicap, he felt, was in the receiver they used something called a coherer that would stick together or cohere in the presence of a radio wave. But as it worked as an on-off switch, it didn't work very well to tell them how powerful the radio wave was. Fezzedin started to play with different receivers that would create a variable resistance with the strength of the radio wave. One of these systems induced a voltage in the secondary wire with a telephone speaker attached that would beep. Fezzedin used a transmitter, which he thought had a peculiar wailing sound, and was totally shocked to find that when he hit the long dash on the transmitter, that sound, quote, was reproduced with absolute fidelity on the receiving telephone. Fezzedin was instantly convinced that he could transmit sound wirelessly or make the first wireless telephone. At the time, the system to create radio waves was called a spark gap generator, and it would create a pulse of radio waves in a spark a number of times every second, usually around 20 to 50. Fezzedin's friend made a blueprint for a new spark gap generator that would produce about 10,000 sparks every second. So it basically made continuous, although uneven, radio waves. By 1900, it was complete, and Fezzedin attached a microphone to the transmitter so that when a person talked into the microphone, it compressed or extended the carbon fibers in it to change the resistance, and thus the amplitude or strength of the current. Because the system modulated the amplitude, it was eventually called AM radio for amplitude modulation. He managed to send a signal over a mile. However, to him, it created an, quote, extremely loud and disagreeable noise due to the irregularity of the spark. Okay. One, two, three, four. In 1904, Fezzedin joined with General Electric, no Edison anymore, to create smooth, continuous radio waves vibrating at about 100,000 times a second. The idea was to create AC current the same way a generator does, by spinning wires near electromagnets, but spin it ridiculously fast and have as many magnets as possible. Instead of having complicated coils, they created a solid metal disc with radial slots in it filled with non-conducting, non-magnetic material. They hired a 26-year-old wonder kid named Ernst Alexanderson to work full-time on the project. And two years later, in 1906, they finally succeeded. For a time, the Alexanderson alternator was the finest radio producer in the world. However, the final alternator was huge, too heavy to put on a boat, 
and very expensive and hard to operate. In the meantime, Fezzetin also created a better receiver to make radio waves audible, called an electrolytic detector. See, if you have an antenna, you can catch radio waves. If you add a capacitor, or also called a condenser, which is just an object that has two conductive sides with a thin insulator between them, then the capacitor can collect charges on its surfaces. If the capacitor then discharges through a coil, it will create a change in current and a change in magnetic field in a coil, which creates more current in the coil, which then charges the capacitor in the other direction, which then discharges the other way. What I'm trying to say here is if you have a capacitor in the coil, it'll tend to oscillate at a certain frequency. This is called a tank circuit and is the backbone of all radio. Therefore, if you have an antenna with a coil and a capacitor, then you can tune your coil so that it vibrates at the same frequency as the incoming wave. However, if you place that signal in a speaker, it would oscillate way too fast for a human to hear. What Fezzedin needed was a one-way valve or a rectifier. If you then listen to the signal on headphones, the headphones would only respond to the envelope or the uneven amplitude of the signal. So the big question is, how do you make a one-way electrical valve? Fezzedin made his best one in 1903. Fezzedin's detector, which was really just a one-way valve, had a thin piece of platinum in a cup of acid that was connected to a battery with a variable resistor. The resistor would then be adjusted to give a tiny bit of voltage across the detector, which would create a reaction between the acid and the metal, and would create an insulating bubble around the metal. If a separate voltage was placed in the same direction, then the bubble would increase in size and no current could flow. If the voltage was in the opposite direction, then the bubble would decrease and current could flow. Voila, a one-way valve. For a few years, this detector was the most popular radio detector around. So now Fezzedin had a way of making smooth, continuous radio waves, a way of adding sound to it with a microphone, and a way of receiving it with his receptor. It was time to build a giant radio tower and send the first true AM radio signal. On December 10, 1906, they sent out invitations to local scientists and newspaper people to witness history. Wireless transmission of sound over 10 miles. They spoke and played records and even surprised a fisherman on a boat who was expecting the beeps of Morse code, not audible speech. Fezzedin later claimed that he created a whole musical section for the enjoyment of people on a boat on Christmas Eve 1906. But there's much contention about whether that actually happened or not. Even if it did, however, Fezzedin wasn't thinking about broadcasting radio signals. He was thinking about making wireless telephone. Also, Fezzedin began to fight with his co-workers and was fired in 1911. He was known for his temper, famously telling an assistant, quote, don't try to think, you haven't got the brains for it. Fezzedin basically stopped working on wireless altogether. In fact, almost no one was thinking of using wireless technology to transmit sound and music and news and advertising to a box that you could listen to before the 1920s. However, there was one man who did dream of wireless broadcasting way back in 1908. His name was Lee DeForest, and after reading about Fezzedin's wireless telephone system, he decided to create a wireless telephone company. DeForest said that with his wireless system, quote, the opera may be brought into every home. Someday the news and even advertising will be sent out to the public over the wireless telephone. DeForest also dreamed that people could gather in a large salon and with a huge receiver, people could hear the music simultaneously. DeForest was a visionary, but he also stole most of his devices. How this con artist accidentally transformed our world is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a thumbs up and check out the next one about DeForest. It's gonna be good. Okay, have a good day.